Hello, everybody. My guest today is Bill Magnuson. He's the CEO and co-founder of Braze, formerly AppBoy. Bill's humanizing connections between brands and customers at a global scale. By streamlining customers' past, present, and future data in an interactive feedback loop, Braze allows brands to take immediate actions on insights, creating personalized messaging experiences. Bill, are you ready to take us to the top? Absolutely. All right. So, so tell us about the company. What's the company do, and is it a pure play SaaS company? Yeah. So, uh, Braze is. SaaS company, you know, we sell technology, we sell the platform. Um, at our core, what we're trying to do is help uh, people form better relationships with their customers through a customer engagement platform. Um, we've really built Braze to be the backbone of customer engagement for people uh, as they're looking to, you know, run more sophisticated strategies, better engage their customers, form more valuable relationships with them. Interesting. And and walk me through, uh, on average, kind of a customer. Are they going to pay you, you know, a hundred bucks a month, a grand a month, a million a month? What general space are you playing in? So we work with, uh, you know, generally large scale consumer companies. Uh, and so, you know, average annual contract values are in six figures. Okay. Got it. So call it hundred grand or, or, or North. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And walk me through, you know, kind of put this on a timeline for me. when did you launch the company? So we were founded in mid 2011. Uh, so we've been at it here for a little bit over or coming up on seven and a half years. Uh, and, you know, when we first started, you know, I think that uh, we saw this fantastic opportunity in the market where we really fundamentally believed that uh, the advent of, you know, mobile as a technology platform, as a way for brands to communicate with customers, as a way um, to deliver products and services or supplement, um, you know, real, real world products and services would really kind of transform the economy across every vertical um, and transform that relationship between brands and customers. And so when we started, what we wanted to do was bring technology to play in that, you know, particularly hard problem uh, and create an opportunity for brands to reach out with engage and engage customers in a way they couldn't before. And have you been able to kind of grow and scale this bootstrapped or did you kind of give in and say, okay, we're going to raise some capital here? Uh, we raised uh, venture capital from the onset. Okay. Uh, and, you know, over, uh, over time, we've kind of tried to, you know, responsibly match our own growth rate to the transformation that we were seeing in the industry. Uh, you know, I think that the first six years of the company, uh, if you look at the financing history, we raised about $40 million. And now uh, in the last about year and a half, we've actually added another 130 to that. Um, so obviously uh, quite an inflection point recently. And we think that that, you know, is largely matching the opportunity that we're seeing in the market. Got it. So 170 into date. Uh, yeah, roughly. Did you did you choose to do most of that um, on equity, or is a bunch of that kind of debt on the back of a big round? Uh, that's all equity financing. It's all equity financing. Okay, interesting. Yep. Yeah, and we've we've used venture debt a couple times along the way, uh, but you know, presently sitting without debt, and you know, generally preferring equity financing. Tell me quickly, when was the moment you said, okay, now's the right moment to use some venture debt here? Uh, you know, we've never really had to tap it necessarily for operations or anything like that, but just to give us some breathing room, you know, as we were growing, make sure that we weren't uh, under the gun for financing timing so that we could just stay focused on the business fundamentals and not worry about the financing as much. Yep. Makes sense. 2011 is launched six years in, obviously growth there. Uh, it sounds like you're growing even faster over the past 12 months. What have you scaled to today in terms of total customers using you? Uh, so we're... Coming up on about 600 customers uh, today, and you know we've been we'll end the year uh, close to around 300 employees as well, uh, and you know that customer base is across a lot of different verticals. Uh, we kind of broadly break out you know our client base into what we call digital first, uh, and then you know enterprise, uh, but broken out across a lot of different regions. You know one of the things I think that was really interesting, uh, especially as we ha kind of had our provenance with a lot of mobile digital first companies. If you go back to you know 2013, 2014, and some of our early uh, um, clients there that uh, they were a lot more global uh, than, you know, a lot of other businesses were. In Your the past, early customers you know, are, were more global? Yeah, I think more global than even our investors expected, uh, you know, and I think a big part of that was just that the app store and phones and, you know, the distribution platforms were very global and with digital goods and such, and as well as a lot of the new ways for businesses to scale, uh, they were increasingly, you know, being started in places all over the world uh, and scaling all over the world. So we've been kind of global from the very early innings, uh, but now, uh, you know, very much have a, a broad global client base. Talk to me about kind of economics around the SaaS space, obviously critical related to churn cap are for payback, these kinds of things. Help me understand churn and how you measure it at your scale and, and what it is today and how you keep it low. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, looking at... Uh so obviously we're measuring customer churn on kind of a net dollar basis as well as um, from a brand base or from a you know logo, logo. basis and uh, you know it's it's 
changed over time as well, uh, especially as you know we've ascended into working with uh, enterprise companies and as digital first companies and such have also grown uh, in their own size uh, and stability. Uh, in the early days, you know, you, there was uh, you know we worked with a lot of mobile startups, you know, a lot of which didn't survive and what have you. And so um, as we've matured as a business, you know, we've seen uh, our churn, you know declining year over year for the last few years, uh, you know, partially due to uh, improvements that we've made in terms of how we integrate onboard and support customers, as well as just changes in our client mix uh, and, you know, a lot of other kind of business changes. So when you leave expansion out for now, I'm sure you have a healthy engine there, but if you leave that out for a second and look at just gross revenue churn over the past 12 months, I mean, are we talking like five, 10 percent? Where, where do you fall there? Yeah, something like that. Uh, you know, and it depends on the category. Uh, obviously, the kind of more traditional enterprise Fortune 500 are going to be on the lower end of that. And then when we're looking at, um, you know, mid-market uh, digital first companies and other regions, that's going to be a little bit on the higher range. Yep. I've noticed once companies uh, that are at your scale uh, that have your price points, you know, typically have very healthy expansion machines. When a customer or a group signs up for you in year one, I'm going to make this up. Let's say I sign up for a hundred grand. Uh, what, mm -hmm. what do you typically expand that same kind of contract to in year two? Yeah, I mean, it It, it kind of depends because we have a few different archetypes of how we get started with customer. So, um, you know, sometimes we'll start on a particular product or a particular um, set of channels. Uh, you know, we're, we really work across a lot of different mediums and across a lot of different messaging channels. So we're going to work with a client with their mobile user base as well as their web user base. Maybe uh, they're, you know, people using digital set-top boxes if it's a, um, you know, a media client, uh, things like Apple TV or, or what have you. Uh, and then messaging going out across uh, earned channels or, you know, own channels on those first party platforms like delivering messaging to the web or web push, uh, maybe mobile push, maybe email. And so some clients, you know, when we first start working with people, they're going through a digital transformation and we uh, take over all of the client communication for them kind of right out of the gate. Uh, and so when we see growth in those clients, it's usually because their customer base is growing or they're adding new products or we're expanding within um, the corporate umbrella. Uh, in other cases, you know, we've had clients that have grown 10, 20 X uh, because we started out working with them on just one channel. And then, you know, over time, we've kind of taken over all the customer communication. That's great. Well, so let's, uh, let's just look at it at a macro level. Then when you look at net revenue or retention annually across your entire cohort of customers. I assume you're north of 100%. How far north? I'd say yeah, best, best in class is like we've had some people on at 140-ish. I mean, where are you generally? Yeah, I mean, we're a little bit lower than that. Uh, but again, it's kind of a bimodal distribution, right? There's some people that are, you know, huge multiples and then others we just grow as their user base grows. Yep, no, that makes sense. Um, the reason I like to ask that question is I always like to understand how much of your growth year over year is coming from expansion on your cohorts versus brand new customers. Um, what would you, how would you answer that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been that's been an increasing number. So the kind of the amount of our uh, new business that comes from upsell uh, has been growing over time as we've added more channels uh, and as we've added kind of more places that we are. And also, you know, obviously, as our um, as our customers have uh, kind of continued to break down silos within their organizations, this idea of consolidating responsibility for customer communication so that you can kind of have one cohesive experience is really something that we're seeing more and more into the enterprise uh, and and kind of across all different verticals. And so that that's a, been an evolving story for us over time. Uh, and it's, you know, it's something that's been growing. And if you go back even two or three years ago, we didn't have like a dedicated account management function, uh, you know, and now we have that. It's a dedicated team. It's global. Um, you know, it's, it's split out uh, into specializations across different categories as well. So. Some other CEOs I've had on that are that are at your scale or, or north or just barely south, like Cvent, Reggie, you know, Ryan at Qualtrics. When they talk about dollar based CAC, in other words, what they spend to get a new dollar of ARR, a lot of them are actually doing something which most people at lower scale would think is counterintuitive, which is they're pushing their dollar based CAC up because they assume that if you can, you know, whoever spends the most for the customer wins the customer. And if you have confidence in your kind of cohort lifetime value expansion, you have confidence to spend that up front. Where is your head in terms of aggressiveness around CAC? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's another, um, you know, that's another thing that we certainly break down by client category, uh, as well as by region as well. And it all correlates back to renewal rates that we're seeing um, and how that breaks down. So, you know, I think that at a high level, that idea of uh, obviously spend into renewable business, uh, right? We we want to have customer relationships that last for the long term. And, you know, those are the places where we want to be investing dollars uh, from a from a just kind of more kind of absolute number standpoint. You know, we try to benchmark ourselves against uh 
the numbers that are available, right? Uh, so it's it's hard to kind of get the full story, especially yep. as uh, uh, from a lot of people, especially as you know definitions change or what have yep. you. So we like to analyze S ones and kind of look at what companies that went public looked like in the years prior. Uh, you know, as when we look at kind of where our scale is right now to help us understand where we sit in ranges. And I think that our fundamentals uh, and a lot of this due to, you know, I think the we raise relatively less money than a lot of the competitors in our space for the first five, six years of our life. And so uh, there's a lot of kind of discipline uh, and, you know, kind of careful, responsible spending and investment that's ingrained in the culture here. And so, you know, we always benchmark very well uh, kind of within ranges that we that we've been able to collect. What would you so like we obviously saw in terms of another B2B SaaS company, we just saw Qualtrics S1 before obviously SAP scooped in. And so you, we get a good sense of their kind of dollar based CAC. I mean, generally speaking, I'm going to ask this in terms of a ratio, because as you said, you have different archetypes, you put this around, but generally speaking, no matter what the archetype, no matter what the channel, I mean, are you happy with call it a 16 month payback period? Or are you happy with 24 months? You know, you can make money there. What do you try and optimize payback period for? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, we're certainly comfortable, uh, with, depending on the client, we're comfortable, uh, within that range. Uh, you know, we just looking at our turn and renewal and, and, you know, upsell and all those types of things, uh, we can certainly run a sustainable business in a range like that. And we're always at like to, 16 months. Yeah. I mean, okay. like, uh, yeah, certainly. Um, you know, that would be, that's that kind of, those kinds of numbers are fine, but again, it depends a lot on the category, right? Like, and with a large fortune 500 company that 16 to 24 is totally fine. Um, you know, with a smaller, you know, bid market digital first company, um, you know, we obviously need it to be lower than that. So yeah. yeah cause you're, cause you're assuming churn might be a little higher or, or, or lifetime value lower yeah, things like that. And there's, you know, there's business risk with them or the, you know, expansion uh, dynamics are different or whatever it happens to be. Interesting. Um, when you do spend money to, I mean, you spend money to acquire customers, right? Where are you spending that money? I assume there's some headcount of the 300 that are focused on this. I'm assuming you're doing some paid, but anything unique you're doing there? Uh, you know, I, I think I would, I would say if it's something unique, uh, we do a lot of uh, internal dog fooding and use Braze at Braze quite a bit. Uh, and so as we're you know moving, and we do this not just for um, prospects, but also for uh, new customers and for new employees, uh, where these are all just kind of a life cycle journey, right? And we want to be able to kind of communicate and orchestrate across all different channels uh, as we you know are working to improve relationships. And so uh, there's a lot that's done there. Uh, and you know that ability to kind of have real-time data flowing through uh, the system and taking action across a lot of different channels uh, has allowed for us to run, you know, some great strategies. I think that, uh, you know, we're not built to be a kind of B2B scale platform. Uh, you know, we sell primarily into consumer scale businesses. And so it is interesting with us kind of dog fooding uh, our own product at a, a smaller scale than that. Uh, it's an interesting kind of lens from a product insight perspective yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, have you guys passed hundred million bucks in ARR yet? Uh, yeah, we haven't passed that yet. Um, it's certainly within range, you know, the way that we're, uh, the, given our growth rate, uh, you know, it's a number that we can see in the near future. Do you see that like next year? Or you still think you need maybe two years to hit that? I think that we could get there next year for sure. Yeah. It's like, like it's a stretch kind of uncomfortable goal for next year or no, it's like a, we should do this. Otherwise we're not growing how we should. Yeah, we feel good about it. Yeah, that's good. All right, very good. And then in terms of, I mean, today, we can kind of back into a minimum, right? So if everything's starting out at 100 grand in terms of ACVs and you've got over 600 customers, that puts you north of 5 million bucks a month today. Is that accurate? Uh, something like that, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And then when you look at growth year over year, um, where were you about a year ago today? Uh, uh, I don't know, mid 30s, something like that. I don't remember exactly. You, you mean mid, or, like 35, 35% well, year over your growth or ARR? Or, we're chatting, uh, that's, that's ARR. We're chatting December 13th right now. So, uh, you know, obviously Q, end of Q4 is coming up, uh, and end of Q4 was coming up last year. So I don't remember exactly, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, so look, Q4 is a big one. You, you know, your sales reps yep. are going, Hey, listen, buy it now. It's a 30% discount. You avoid the tax man, right? It's an expense. Yeah, we don't, uh, we don't get into timing based discounts, uh, <laughs> like that, you know, no, no, I don't mean here. you discount. I don't mean you discounting. I mean, if, if brands have money left on the table and they spend it with you today, they don't have to pay taxes on that money. So it's, they're essentially getting a 30% discount from the government. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Very good bill. All right. Let's wrap up here quickly with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Uh, I would probably say the hard thing about hard things, uh, is my favorite one I've read in a while. Uh, but you know, I think crossing the chasm, uh, was an early favorite read. Uh, I read that before hard thing about hard things was even published and it's a really interesting lens on uh, product design and markets. Yeah. Jeffrey Moore. It's, it's one a lot of people don't know about, but the ones that know it, know it. <laughs> Number two, yeah, really is there, good. is there an under the radar CEO in New York that you like kind of getting lunch with and learning from? 
Uh, you know, I kind of expanding and continuing to engage with more CEOs is something that I've been working toward, but not uh, not something where I've got a, a good kind of, you know, network right now. I've been sitting in the CEO seat for about two years now. So that's uh, that's something that I've been working at. Oh, got it. You're not so you're not the initial founder. Do you come in with a VC round? I was uh, the co-founding CTO, actually. Oh, okay. I uh, took over the CEO about two years ago. Oh, great. Very good. All right. Uh, number three, what's your favorite online tool for building the business? Uh, you know, I think that when I look at this, the favorite, uh, favorite tool in general is, you know, we're trying to work to be more data driven, um, make sure we can kind of stamp out bias and make good, uh, decisions around the organization. And so one of the areas that we have invested pretty heavily into, um, at least in comparison to a lot of the people that I talked to at our stage is in, uh, technology and software in the people space. So we're using, you know, Greenhouse as our ATS. We're using um, Lattice for performance management and OKRs. We're using uh, Bamboo for, you know, just kind of directory and, and other sorts of HR tracking information. And we're also using CultureAmp for, uh, you know, quarterly engagement surveys and things like that. So, uh, and then we've got Braze at Braze tying all those things together uh, in order to kind of pull the data through and, and move people through a customer journey. And that Braze at Braze stack is also hooked into SkillJar, uh, which we're using for uh, internal employee enablement as well as customer training and such. So we've got some good uh, kind of collaboration going on there amongst both internally and externally facing teams. And so there's there's kind of a, a full data flow and software stack that we're putting to bear there. You've got, a, mach you got a machine. Bill, how many hours of sleep are you getting every night? Uh, not enough. Uh, you know, it depends on whether I'm traveling or I'm at home. Uh, and the, uh, the kids wake up at about six 30 every morning. So it's, uh, <laughs> so, so how, what would you say? Like six, seven hours, maybe something like that. Yeah. 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 And two kids More on the weekends, you know, <laughs> less during the day. So <laughs> two kids, you said married. Yep. And how old are you yep. live in the East village? Uh, I am 31, 31. Last question. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Oh man. I don't know. There's a lot that uh, a lot you go through in business in life that uh, you don't get to do very many times. Uh, you know, founding a company is one of those things. Fundraising is another, uh, you know, big, big personal life decisions, uh, you know, buying a house, getting married, et cetera. Kids. Uh, more. Yeah. Kids. More context on any of those things would obviously be helpful for a 20 year old self. But uh, I don't know if that's really I don't know if any of our 20 year old selves are really ready to impart <laughs> the uh, the wisdom of the ages on any of those topics. So, yeah, guys, enjoy you know, Enjoy the journey again. Braze helping uh, helping uh, customer and helping big brands really understand customer engagement, simplifying it. Formerly App Boy, you know, call it thirty to thirty five million dollar run rate a year ago. Now growing, call it five million ish per month. That's from six hundred enterprise customers paying north of hundred thousand dollar ACVs. Founded in twenty eleven, Bill was the co founding uh, CTO. Took over as CEO about two years ago. Today there are about three hundred people, one hundred seventy million bucks raised to drive that growth uh, revenue churn. Or sorry, net revenue retention. Again, a little south of call it 140%, so healthy expansion revenue, totally healthy depending on the archetype between a 16 and 24 month payback period as they look to scale. Bill, thanks for taking us to the top. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me.